Hello and welcome back. Happy Wednesday, everyone. Today we are going to be going through Tento Talk number 8, aka Project Caesar, aka Project Teaser, aka Europa Universalis 5, but Europa Universalis 5 because we're not sure yet. Uh, but there's increasingly, you know, like every time there's another one of these uh, Tinto Talks, it's like more and more apparent that it's going to be Europa Universalis 5. And for me, what's becoming the real question is, um, when's the end date going to be? Uh, are they going to give room for a game, potentially, for, like, the Napoleonic Wars for a period in between the end of this game and Victoria 3? Or are they just going to bump it up uh, against uh, kind of the edge of Victoria 3? I would prefer, uh, you know, the, the, the potential for a mega campaign spanning the entire, you know, history, uh, starting with European Universalis 4. And so... We'll see what happens, or starting with, uh, you know, Imperator, but we'll see what happens, you know, regarding the dates. Uh, it's looking like it's early 1300s on the start. Um, but we have here, hello and welcome to the 8th iteration of Tinto Talks, where we talk about what we are doing in a way, uh, uh, in our very secret future game with the codename Project Teaser. Um, I've never seen anyone ever misspell Happy Wednesday as, quite as badly as this, uh, but yeah, we're, we're talking about Project Teaser. Uh, by the way, on a completely unrelated note, by, <laughs> I love this sentence, because no one ever says completely unrelated, uh, unironically. To my, like, I cannot recall a single time that someone said completely unrelated, um, except for, you know, when they're slash sarcasm. Uh, Paradox Tinko has announced a new expansion for Winds of Sa Change for EU4. So this, to me, is an indication of two things. Um, one, he's, like, making a joke because it's completely unrelated, completely unrelated, but it's really the fourth game, um, uh, expansion for the fourth game when we're talking about the fifth game and it's completely related. Um, and secondly, uh, the fact that they're releasing DLC for EU4 4 still implies that the release of this game is probably at the very least uh two years away uh and it probably if i were to guess uh like if i were to take it over under um i would take it over two years uh but some people think that a year and a half i think that if they're releasing um you know content still for eu4 i don't know maybe they can't announce officially uh eu4 or eu5 while they're still releasing eu content uh eu4 content because that doesn't make any sense but we will watch the trailer Peggy here 12. change change is inevitable for one it is the rise of a new dawn for another it is the cast of a dark night the wind whispers of great empires that may soon be laid in ruins, and of subdued nations on their ascent to dominate the world. It sows uncertainty, yet holds a promise. We brave the hardship, we welcome the battle, as we raise our heads hopeful and inspired. Subtle with its invisible strokes, the hand of a master strategist shapes our world with the winds of change. Pre-purchase now, uh, and you get three free songs. All right. So, that's what it is. Uh, and uh, you can pre-purchase it, um, apparently, right now. Um, again, uh, in my mind, this is a further indication that the date we are going to be receiving EU5 is going to be a waves back. Sorry, EU5. Um, this week, we'll continue talking about the economic part of the game. Last week, we talked about different items in the monthly budget, and now we'll continue with explaining some of the core concepts of the economy. Please be aware that all the images here are part of tooltips, or are tooltips or parts of tooltips, and are very much work in progress. Uh, you know, especially the, the placeholder icon is <laughs> indeed the most whip of all things. Okay, so the first thing we'll talk about is loans and bankruptcy. Let's start with loans. Let's please, which will work a fair bit differently than any other previous Paradox Grand Strategy game. Uh, at first glance, it's kind of similar to previous games. Two previous games. It's kind of similar to previous games, uh, of course, is deeply implying that it is, uh, or I guess not deeply, but it's within the grand genre, the genre of Paradox games, it's implying that there are previous games, uh, and that if you look at it uh, more kind of not directly but um it implies that there's previous games of this type of installment of a game um which would be the european universalis where you can take a loan you get money and you pay interest on it for a set period of time however in project caesar there are some new changes uh take a look at this whip uh tooltip for taking a loan you take a loan it has yearly interest of 10 percent. the estates have made uh blank available to the loan so you're borrowing from the estates 
I don't know if this is the case of how it works in EU4, uh, but this is kind of how it works in Vicky 3 You borrow from uh, the people who own the buildings. Uh, yeah, 10% interest is perfectly fair. It's usury. Um, I don't know, I feel like interest rates were really, really low during that time period because usury was a sin, uh, but I, I, I don't know this off the top of my head. In this game, you are not borrowing money from an abstract national bank, but instead your internal loans are taken from what the estates have made available. The estates invest money they have, uh, they have not only in immediate gains for their own power, but it, or in other ways for the country, or other redacted, but they also invest in having money available for the country, uh, where, uh, they will benefit from the interest. So... They, they create a pool of money for which you can draw, which is, you know, similar to a Victoria 3 mechanic, but mostly redacted. Um, if there's no money to borrow from the estates, uh, from the estates available and you have no ducats left, you will go bankrupt. Big sad, which is a bit more severe than, let's say, an EU4. Um, it's been a while. It's been a hot minute since I was in the EU4 streets, but from what I remember, you would intentionally go bankrupt fairly often. So, um, yeah. There's another way to get gold. You can send a diplomat to one of the banking uh, countries like uh, Peruzzi and Bardi if there's one that uh, the one that you know of within diplomatic range to request to take a loan. So this implies that you can also be a loan shark. Make sure you don't forget to pay them on time or default on the loans or you may never be able to take a loan from them again. Okay. So core concepts. Let's continue by taking a look at a tooltip for a location so that we can quickly have a reference to some important aspect of the, uh, for the rest, rest of this development diary. So we're taking a look at Kalmar, uh, which is a location. The town of Kalmar is in the province of Ostra uh, Smaland. Uh, sorry for my pronunciation, is owned by Sweden. It's got population, it's got raw material stone. We're going to talk more about raw materials later. Dominant religion, Catholicism, dominant culture, Swedish. Tax base is 42, which we will get into the taxes in a bit. Markets Riga, food uh, is minus 420, uh, 410. Just muscle memory there. Uh, and uh, climate is continental, flatlands, woodlands, vegetation, all with the work in progress. Uh, of course, we don't have an icon for this yet. Enjoy the place, nice placeholder icons. We did, thank you. Sadly, the form, happily, don't you mean? Doesn't allow for a nested tooltip like the game does? Yeah, that's true. It doesn't. Work on your forearms, skip better. Um, <clears throat> for, did I say forearms? I meant uh, forums. Okay, so food, you may notice the food, uh, food above Notice the line of food above. You'll see that Calamar is not self-sufficient in food and needs to rely on the rest of Ostra Smaland for the food unless they take it from the local market. This is very much reminiscent of Imperator, or this might just be in the Invictus mod, but I think it's just Imperator. Uh, you see Calamar, uh, you see where its food is coming from, its food or produces uh, food each month due to peasants or slaves. Uh, continental uh, river flowing through. Uh, so we're going to see a lot of modifiers, which of course are going to inform where you're going to want to place things. I assume. Uh, so if river fro flowing through, maybe you want to put more farms on this. Of course, I, I'm guessing the rivers are going to be good for um, being more city oriented. And we see we get less because it's a town. And so uh, where areas start to get a little bit more urban, uh, you of course will have penalties for the rural resources. Uh, traditional economy, 18%. Serfdom, plus 5%. Peasants to state satisfaction, get a little bonus in feudal administration. And we see the consumption where the nobles consume some, clerics, burgers, peasants, and the burgers are probably disproportionately consuming a very large amount, which implies that as you become a big city and you become less rural, um, that, you know, uh, you are going to be placing more demand. Even the small town of Kalmar needs food from more locations. Primarily, there are a lot of burgers here who consume food. Uh, there's also a lot of modifiers that impact how much food uh, the location produces as well. Uh, if the granaries of Ostra Smaland are close to full, uh, we would sell their surplus to the local market in Riga. So recall, uh, the local market here is in Riga uh, for the Kalmar. <coughs> Uh, or from Austria Smallland. So Kalmar is a individual location within uh, the province of uh, Austria Smallland, uh, which is within the market of Riga, which appears to be a more macro scale uh, or less macro scale than Sweden, or unless Riga is just the market for Sweden entirely, uh, but only gets about 56% of the profit as we only have 50% control in Kalmar. Uh, so if we scroll up, did it have control? Um, 
doesn't list control here, but we'll talk about control and taxes. If the entire province lacks food, we would have to buy food at the 100% the current price in the market. Uh, the price for food is different in each market. It depends entirely on how much food is sold to that market. Um, Okay, so we are going to have quite a bit in-depth mechanics regarding food, uh, which of I assume will kind of uh, inform play quite a bit. It is a bit interesting. Next up, we have taxes, um, which are going to be pretty, pretty interesting. We mentioned taxes last week's Tinto Talk, specifically talked about tax base there. The tax base is of an estate is based on the total of all their tax base. The tax base of an estate is based on all the total tax based in the locations they are present in. That sounds like a circular sentence, but okay. But the idea is is that uh, you're going to have a maximum potential for taxes, uh, then like a current practical potential, and then a current what you're actually achieving. Um, and what I think is pretty interesting about this is that all of the excess or all of the difference between the maximum and what you are currently getting is actually gonna go to the estates. And so this is how the estates get money. And as you have more control, you get a larger share of the money. And as the estates have a more control they get a larger share of money tax income is gained from taxing the profit buildings and resource gathering operations the amount you can tax depends on the control of the location okay and so it's going to be interesting i hope that the strategy isn't always to have maximal crown authority uh but instead sometimes it being good to play to the estates um such that you know you are going to give them more control they will get money and they will be able to develop the land perhaps more efficiently for you for greater long-term gains we'll see how this works uh quickly find the error in the text of the tooltip oh no quickly find it i didn't look for before um the tax income is gained from taxing the profit buildings and resource gathering operations profit buildings is that like uh incorrect the amount you can tax uh, depends on the control of location all right fair enough there uh, maybe there's something wrong with the paradox math we're not going to look too great into it if you spot it though put it in the comments I don't know what's wrong with that tooltip. We're slowly increasing our control of Kalmar up to 58%, so the tax base will slowly be increasing. And if we would get it to the 100 maximum, it would be even bigger. So if we got the control up to 100%, which is apparently not possible uh, for this country in this tooltip at this time, uh, we would be getting the maximum tax instead we get less. As you can see here, the nobility and the burghers each have a fair bit of power. Uh, you can see that uh, their tax rate Okay, so the tax rate is going to be applying to each of the estates. Um, and this does not add up to this, does it? No. And also, is there... Is this not 25% of this? The bondage stat is 25% or whatever. Um, so, okay. Uh, they have a fair bit of power here, and the peasants have basically none. Currently, we are able to tax more from the burghers each month and could probably go above the 25% tax rate we currently have on their estate. So um, I'm guessing each one of these guys will have economic activity. Um, the economic activity uh, is going to contribute to the tax base. Uh, your tax rate will then inform um, you know, how much you're taking from them, and then all of this together will give this combined... Um, uh, or the, all this tax base together will give this combined, although the math, does that math, I don't think it maths. So 0 0.6 plus this is 0 0.2, 0 0.38, 0 0.42, I guess it does math. Okay, the math's mathing. Is there, you know what that would be the really troll thing? Is there no, being no error and then telling you to find an error? Uh, to clarify this, only the money that is in the potential row exists, and anything you don't tax goes to the estates. Um, this, for me, is the heart of what might be a very interesting uh, gameplay kind of interaction if there is reason to empower the estate. Um, you know, if uh, going for, uh, like, kind of a more hands-off thing leads to better long-term growth, for example, um, it'll be interesting. You can get 0.05 ducats there, perhaps more, but Paradox is rounding, and the remaining 0.37 go to the estates. Okay. And next, we'll see raw materials. As you may have noticed, there was stone in the example of uh, Kalmar. We, if we scroll up, they were producing as their raw material stone, but just a single raw material. 
Um, as you notice in the tooltip above, we talk about raw materials and resource gathering operations. Every location has one raw um, material possible that can be extracted. This includes things like lumber, stone, grain, or copper. Again, reminiscent of Imperator, and it's probably going to be, this is probably going to be a detail that greatly informs where you decide to build towns and where the places you decide to keep agrarian. Uh, if what buildings you build uh, changes how much of the resource you can extract. Um, and we do see grain in there. Um, of, of course, there are other ways to get access to raw materials than merely owning and controlling a location. Only peasants and slaves will work on get, gathering raw materials, and how many will work depends on how big of an infrastructure you have built for that. Pops that are working uh, with this will not be producing food unless the goods are food related, like grain. And so, okay. So it may be the case that it's really hard to build a really, really big city unless your um, material is grain. I don't know. We'll see. The maximum size of an infrastructure that can be built, be built up there depends on population, development, technologies, and societal values. And we see the raw goods. For Kalmar, it produces one stone each month with 1,000 peasants or slaves. These are then sold for 0.7 in the Riga market. Um, I'm not sure if this implies fluctuating price. They did say that the amount of food would change the food price. Um, but will all goods have a fluctuating price? I don't know. I would hope so. Um, you know, uh, this would be very interesting if the more that there is demand, uh, the more the stuff sells for. Uh, this would be, uh, I think, much more interesting and dynamic. It might lead to a lot of calculations. Um, I don't know if it's too much a strain on the resources of the game. Uh, and by resources, I mean, like, uh, electronic resources, not resources, raw goods resources. And so this this remains to be seen. When fully upgraded, Kalmar can support uh, 12,000 working within it, which implies that you could sell uh, 12 stone, uh, and then each of those would be sold for 0.7. Um, expand mines in Kalmar will cost 44.45. Um, okay, so when fully upgraded. So maybe it's not fully upgraded yet and we're upgrading up to this 12,000, or maybe we're upgrading beyond the 12,000 takes 180 days and will allow the employment of plus 1,000 peasants or slaves in the stone mines. During construction, it will require access to the following goods in Riga market. Uh, lumber. And there's zero available in the market. So, I'm hoping that, like, for example, if we did this, if we added uh, this construction, then this would increase the price of the lumber in the market because the market can't provide it. I'm not sure if this will happen, but um, that would be that would be neat. We mentioned uh, buildings in one tooltip earlier, and next week we will talk about how they work in Project Teaser. Okay, so we will, uh, yeah, just kind of a little bit of a short one, talked about raw materials, taxes, um, food, uh, and core concepts here. Was pretty excited, and the loans, pretty excited to see that uh, loans are uh, probably not going to be as meta. Or intentionally going bankrupt. I always thought that was like a very weird mechanic. I think that bankruptcy should be something you really want to avoid uh, rather than something you intentionally do in a lot of runs. Um, uh, the food situation is going to be distinct and it's going to gate how many people you can um, how many people you can uh, have in a place, as well as uh, what was pretty interesting here is that the price of the food is going to be dependent. Um, the price for food in, is different in each market and depends entirely on how much food is sold to that market. So for me, this is a pretty interesting thing because I think this is the first we've heard of dynamic prices, uh, which of course makes the economy much more interesting. Um, the prices in like EU4, from what I recall, are dynamic to some degree in the sense that there are events that change the price, but for the most part, the prices just all stay the same. Um, and then we have taxes. Um, we have what I think was pretty critical in this um, thing was that the estates are getting paid and the estates do stuff with the money, uh, as we saw from, you know, some of them, uh, some of the money um, will... Uh, be available for uh, borrowing, uh, but they do a lot of other things, um, and they perhaps can do stuff more efficiently than the state. That would be really cool. Um, and so for me, that was a pretty key one here. Raw materials, uh, we notice it's kind of like similar to Imperator. It's produced in a single state. You're probably going to want to build around certain resources. 
as well as uh, we got to see a bunch of modifiers applying to Kalmar here, uh, like traditional economy, town, coastal, river flowing through, these types of things. These will also uh, inform, uh, I think, where you will want to build and probably can make a spreadsheet with all these modifiers and that would make a lot of sense. Um, and then, yeah, that was, uh, that was the dev diary, of course, for Project Caesar. Um, I hope you guys enjoyed. If you did, please feel free to like, comment, subscribe, do the YouTube algorithm thing. And other than that, have a happy Wednesday.